Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of the podcast called The Dictionary. You should know that because you turned it on, so that is what you are listening to. Today is April 9th, which is the first day of Passover in the Jewish religion. Uh, It's actually a pretty big holiday, Uh, one of the ones that my family, uh, my mom's side, would celebrate every year. Um, And I don't really know if we're going to get to celebrate that this year. Um, So, you know, to all of my Jewish listeners, happy Passover. Uh, Yeah, still still quarantined. I'm not going to keep on saying that every episode because that is just going to get repetitive for you and for me. So, let us say the first word. It is bed, B-E-D. It is the uh, second form. The first form was in the last episode. This is a verb from before the 12th century, 1A. Uh, Oh, and uh, the intransitive definitions are first. 1A, to find or make sleeping accommodations, usually used with the word down, as in a place to bed down. 1B, to go to bed. Oh, that sounds great right about now. Usually used with the word down, as in bed down at midnight. I don't think I've heard it used that way. Number two, to form a layer. Number three, to lie flat or flush. And then here we go with the transitive definitions. 1A, to furnish with a bed or bedding. Settle in sleeping quarters. Often used with the word down again. Now we have 1B, to put, take, or send to bed. All you people with kids uh, are familiar with that. 2A, we have the synonym embed, E-M-B-E-D. Like a video is embedded into a web page. 2B, to plant or arrange in beds. 2C, synonyms are base and establish. 3A, to lay flat or in a layer. 3B, to make a bed in or of. And then number four, to have sexual intercourse with. That was a fun way to end that one. Now we have B-E-D, capital B, capital E, lowercase d. It is an abbreviation for Bachelor of Education. Next is beddable or beadable, B-E-D-A-B-B-L-E. It is a transitive verb from 1590, and it is archaic, and it means to wet or soil by dabbing, no, dabbling. What did I say beddable? Or is it, oh, it's bedabble or bedabble. I thought I read this before. To wet or soil by dabbling. Now we have bed and breakfast. Three words with hyphens in between them all. Number two, no, number, what? It is a noun from 1978. An establishment, as an inn, offering lodging and breakfast. And, of course, we all should be familiar with Airbnb, which completely changed the world of hotels and B&Bs and staying in places. Um, And um, it's been really great. You get to go stay at a place that is much nicer and larger, usually, than what you would have stayed at, um, often for the same price or cheaper. So, yay, Airbnb. Um, We might have one of those one day when we're old and gray. Next, we have Bidob. B-E-D-A-U-B. It is a verb from 1558. Only transitive definitions. Number one, to daub over. Synonym is besmear. Number two, to ornament with vulgar excess. Bedaub. Now we have bedazzle. It is a transitive verb from circa 1616. One, to confuse by a strong light. I didn't realize if you wanted to confuse somebody by a strong light, you could say that you bedazzled them. I mean, I've heard, like the next one. Number two, to impress forcefully. Enchant is a synonym. Bedazzle, you've been bedazzled. But now if I'm going to shine a light in somebody's face, I'm going to say I'm bedazzling you. Bedazzlement is a noun. Now we have bed bug, noun from 1708. A wingless, blood-sucking, hemipterous bug sometimes infesting houses and especially beds and feeding on human blood. Ooh, sounds great. The scientific name is Simex lactularius. I hope, I don't think I've ever had bedbugs. Uh, I know bedbugs have definitely been a thing in New York. 
Uh, and it sounds like it sucks, and you have to clean everything, and uh, it's a pain. Um, hemipterous bug. H-E-M-I-P-T-E-R-O-U-S. I think that means that they that they are blood-sucking, um, although it's a little redundant because it says blood-sucking hemipterous, uh, but I'll have to look up what hemipterous means. Now we have bedchamber. It is a noun from the 14th century, and we just have the synonym bedroom. Next is bed... Ch- oh, and I forgot, there's a picture of a bed bug. Uh, kind of looks like a tick. It's got a very wide body... Looks like six legs, couple antennas, good times. Next is bed check, two words, noun from 1919. I've had bed bugs. You had had bed bugs? (laughs) Not anymore. Years and years and years ago, I had bed bugs at a place I used to live. What did you have to do to get rid of them? Uh, We had to have someone from Orkin come and spray the whole house and... It, I think it only kills the, um, or it, it makes the females not able to uh, reproduce anymore. I don't think it actually kills them, but then they die off pretty quickly after that. But I have no idea how we got them. But they disappeared one day, and we would wake up every night with bites on us and rip off the sheets on the bed and find them in between the seams of the mattress. They were sucking your blood. They were gross. Gross. Uh, maybe I'll put a link uh, in the episode description of a place where you can go. If you have bed bugs, you can learn what you have to do. This is Spencer's wife, by the way. <laughs> she finally agreed to say something. <laughs> she might. Uh, she didn't want a microphone, but she said she might come by and say things every once in a while. All right. So bed check, third try. Number, it's a noun. I don't know why I keep on saying it's a number. No, I just say the letter N and I say it's a noun. Say noun, not number. Stupid. It's from 1919. A night inspection to check the presence of persons, as soldiers, required by regulations to be in bed or in quarters. Bed check. It's bed check time. You gotta go sleep. Next is bed clothes. One word. Noun from the 14th century. The covering, as sheets and blankets, used on a bed. All right, what's your opinion on this? Do you like top sheets Or do you not like top sheets? I think I'm one of the few people who actually does not care for a top sheet. I think it's kind of silly and pointless. But again, you know, not again. But if your blanket is maybe itchy or something, then yeah, sure, you want a top sheet. Tell me your opinions. Send me a message on the email, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Reddit, uh, what was it, Instagram. Let me know what you think about sheets and stuff. Okay, next is bed cover uh so the last one was bed clothes those are the clothes that you put on the bed and now this is bed cover it could also be bed covering it is a noun from circa 1656 number one we have the synonym bedspread number two synonym is bed clothes i have never heard the term bed clothes before but i think that's hilarious i'm gonna have to start calling uh, the sheets and the blankets the bed clothes uh, and it is usually used in plural Now we have bedded, B-E-D-D-E-D. It is an adjective from 1773, having a bed or beds of a specific, no, a specified kind or number, used in combination, as in a twin bedded room. Does that mean that the room has a twin bed or that there are two twin beds? Maybe both, maybe neither. Now we have better. It is a noun from 1849, Number one, a bedding plant. A bedding plant? Uh, Bedding is the next word. We'll get there in a second. Number two, a person who makes up beds. Uh, Sharon, when we were in Jamaica, there was some... There was one of those nights, like, after dinner, they had, like, a contest, and they split up the group of men and women. Uh And I think I was tasked to make a bed. Uh Do you remember that? Okay, I did lose. I sure <laughs> lost. I made the bed. So yeah, it was this weird like uh, men versus women competition that they were doing at the the resort that we were at. And um, one of the things, and I got called up to do it, was make a bed as fast as you can. I think it was the sheets and the, the pillow covers and everything. So I made it the way that I had been trained to make it, but they make their beds a little bit differently. And of course, the woman had paid attention uh, on how they make their bed, so she made it the correct way. But I did not expect to win that one. 
they the sheets over the blanket. Uh-huh. All right, that's weird. Sheets over the blankets. All right, we're not going to quote her on that one though. Uh, all right, next is bedding. So the last one was better, and that was a bedding plant. This is bedding. It is the first form. Noun from before the 12th century. Number one, synonym is my favorite word, bedclothes. Number two, a bottom layer. Synonym is foundation. Number three, material to provide a bed for livestock. And number four, synonym is stratification. Now we have the second form of bedding. It is an adjective from 1836. Suitable for planting in large groups in flower beds to produce a mass display, as in bedding plants. And this is from the gerund of the second form of bed, which was the first word of this episode. Now we have the word bedeck. It is a transitive verb from 1565. Number one, to clothe with finery. Synonym is deck. So just no, no B. Number two, uh, we have the number two definition for the word decorate as the synonym. Next is bedevil. The word devil with B at the front. It is a transitive verb from 1574. One, to possess with or as if with a devil. Number two, to cause distress. Synonym is trouble. Number three, to change for the worse. Synonym is spoil. And then number four, to confuse utterly. Bedevilment is a noun. Next is bedew or bedew or bedew. So many options. It is a transitive verb from the 14th century. To wet with or as if with dew. I just like saying it that way. Uh, Next is bedfast. Adjective from 1560. Synonym is bedridden or bedridden. No, I think you'd say bedridden. Next is bedfellow. Noun from the 15th century. One, one who shares a bed with another. Number two, synonyms are associate and ally. I wanted to say associate, but I don't think that is the correct pronunciation here. As in political bedfellows. Next is Bedford Cord. Two words, Bedford has a capital B. It is a noun from 1860. A clothing fabric with lengthwise ribs that resembles corduroy. Also, the weave used in making this fabric. This is perhaps from New Bedford in Massachusetts. Next is bed hop. There is a hyphen. It is an intransitive verb from 1943. And then the the synonym is sleep around. So if you sleep around, you hop from bed to bed and you bed hop. And then it doesn't say this, but the noun I assume would be a bed hopper. Next is bedite. Bedite. B-E-D-I-G-H-T. It is a transitive verb from the 15th century. It is archaic. And the synonyms are equip and array. And then our last word for this episode is bedim, B-E-D-I-M, transitive verb from 1565. Uh, Number one, to make less bright. You could also just say dim. Uh, And number two, to make, make indistinct. Obscure is a synonym. Well, I'm going to have to pick bedclothes as the word of the episode And, um, oh, I just heard on a podcast this morning that there are two words, it sort of depends on how you look at it, but there are two words in the English dictionary that have the most definitions. Um, I literally just listened to the podcast that talked about it this morning, and so I had to tell you, they are the words, uh, well, I don't know if I want to tell you, well, I'll tell you one of them. One of them is the word run, R-U-N. I'm sure you could just easily Google it, but... Uh, If you think you know what it is without Googling it, let me know. Uh, Maybe I'll let you know what the other word is in the next episode. Um, But, spoiler alert, you're not going to hear either one of them for a long time. In this podcast, at least. Anyway, that is it. Thank you very much for listening. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to this quarantine version of the podcast called The Dictionary. I am still sitting here at my dining room table. I've been sitting here for two weeks, it feels like. 
I think almost literally. Today is April 10th, which is Good Friday. It is, um, this website tells me it's a state holiday. Uh, I thought it was more of a of a Christian holiday, but uh, it's saying a state holiday in Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Indiana, Kentucky, Louisiana, North Carolina, uh, North Dakota, New Jersey, Tennessee, and Texas. I'm assuming then maybe um, that means that everybody has the day off in those states. Interesting. The first word is bediver, capital B-E-D-I-V-E-R-E. Uh, it is a noun from the 15th century in the he, I think, he is a knight of the round table. There might be a sneeze in my near future. Let's see. Uh, next, we have bedizen, B-E-D-I-Z-E-N. It is a verb, a transitive verb from 1661, to dress or adorn gaudily, and bedizement is a noun. Next, we have bedlam, noun from circa 1529. Number one is obsolete. Synonyms are madman and lunatic. Number two is often capitalized. A lunatic asylum. And number three, a place, scene, or state of uproar and confusion. Bedlam is an adjective as well. So this is from Bedlam. It is a popular name for the hospital of St. Mary of Bethlehem, London, which is an an insane asylum. From Middle English, Bedlam which means Bethlehem. Next is Bedlamite. It is a noun from 1589. Synonyms are madman and lunatic. And Bedlamite is also an adjective. Uh, And it doesn't say it specifically, but it seems pretty obvious that this is from the word Bedlam. Uh, So it's, you know, somebody who was from the insane asylum or something like that. Next, we have Bedlington Terrier, two words with a capital B. It is a noun from 1867, a swift, lightly built terrier of English origin with a long, narrow head, arched back, and usually curly coat, called also Bedlington. This is from the word Bedlington, which is a parish in Northumberland, England. Next is Bedmate, noun from 1582. One who shares one's bed, especially a sexual partner. Next is Bed of Roses from 1576, a place or situation of agreeable ease. Next is Bedouin. Bedouin, Bedouin, the few pronunciations, B-E-D-O-U-I-N. You could also spell it without the O. This is a noun from the 14th century, a nomadic Arab of the Arabian, Syrian, or Northern African deserts. And this is from the Middle English Bedouin, B-E-D-O-Y-N-E, from Middle French Bedouin, B-E-D-O-I-N, from the, I think that's Arabic word, Badawi, which is uh, a desert dweller from B-A-D-W. I don't know how to say that, which means desert or desert dwellers. Next is bed pan, noun from 1678, a shallow vessel used by a bedridden person for urination or defecation. Yes, it is. Next is bed plate, noun from 1817, a plate or framing used as a support. Next is bedpost, noun from 1598, the usually turned or carved post of a bed. If you are fancy enough to have a bed with bedposts. Next is bedraggle, verb, transitive verb from 1727, to wet thoroughly. I didn't know that you could, to bedraggle something, you make it very wet. Uh, next is bedraggled with a with an ed. This is the adjective version. It is from circa 1775. One soiled and stained by or as if by trailing in mud. Number two left wet and limp by or as if by rain. I imagine a dog or a cat. You know, probably like a cat coming back uh, after they've been out and they are just bedraggled by the rain. 
And then number three, synonym is dilapidated, as in bedraggled buildings. Next is bed rest, noun from 1902, confinement of a sick person to bed. Next is bedridden, also bedrid. It is an adjective from the before the 12th century, confined as if, uh, sorry, as by illness, so confi- confined to bed. And then in parentheses it says, as by illness. This is an alternative of the Middle English bedred, B-E-D-R-E-D-E, or bedreden, from the Old English bedreda, from bedreda, which is one confined to bed, from bed with a second D, which is from bed plus rida or rida, from ridan, which means to ride, and there's more at the words bed and ride. So you're basically just having a ride in the bed, um, probably sleeping a lot. What a weird word. Next is bedrock. One word. No, first form. It is one word, though. Noun from 1839. Number one, the solid rock underline unconsolidated surface materials as soil. Number two, A, lowest point. And to B, synonym is basis. Now we have the second form of bedrock. It is an adjective from 1873. Solidly fundamental, basic, or reliable. Synonym, um, no, as in traditional bedrock values. Also as in a bedrock constituency. Next we have bedroll, noun from 1849. Bedding rolled up for carrying. Next is bedroom. It is the first form, noun from 1600. A room furnished with a bed or and intended primarily for sleeping. Bedroomed is an adjective. I feel, I don't, that's a weird adjective. Your house is bedroomed? Well, what house isn't bedroomed? That's a strange adjective. Now we have the second form of bedroom. It is an adjective from 1900. Number one, dealing with, suggestive of, or inviting sexual relations, as in a bedroom farce, also as in bedroom eyes. Number two, inhabited or used by commuters, as in a bedroom community. Next is, I think we'll do two more. Next is BEDS, B-E-D-S with a capital B. It is an abbreviation for Bedfordshire, or it might be more appropriately said as Bedfordshire. I don't know. All right, the last word is bed sheet. It is a noun from the 15th century, an oblong piece of usually cotton or linen cloth used as an article of bedding. You could also say that it is a piece of bed clothes. So the word of the episode is going to be bedraggled, because that's a fun word. Reminds me of Fraggle Rock a little bit, too. That is it for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you all are doing great and staying clean and staying away from the people who might be sick and wash your hands and follow all the procedures and make sure that when you, uh, if you don't clean something and wipe it down or wash it, that you let it sit for at least three days before you're using it uh, because that's how long the coronavirus supposedly lives on surfaces. We live in a weird time and I hope it's over soon. Thank you. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of the podcast called The Dictionary. Uh, I just remembered that two episodes ago, I said that uh, there are a couple of words that have the most definitions in the dictionary, and I forgot to tell you what the second word was in the last episode. So I'll tell you right now. Uh, So the first word is run. Supposedly, it has somewhere between, I don't know, four and 600 definitions. Um, And then the other word, which has about the same amount, um, I should probably find a link to this. It is the word set, S-E-T. It has hundreds of definitions. um, And that will be, those will be exciting words to get to uh, whenever that happens, if I make it that far. Uh, And that reminds me of this game I, I learned when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old called set. And it's uh, it's still around, and it's a great game, and I think you all should learn it. It's very difficult for uh, kids, or no, for adults to learn it because, you know, it's just harder. Uh, but if you've got kids, 
you should teach them the game set. Uh, and I actually just went to the page for set. There are three forms and they take up, oh, probably more than a full column in this, which is insane. Okay, now let us say some words. The first word for this episode is bedside. B-E-D-S-I-D-E. It is the first form. Noun from the 14th century. The side of a bed. A place beside a bed. Second form of bedside. Adjective from 1787. One of relating to or conducted at the bedside. As in a bedside diagnosis. Number two. Suitable for reading in bed. As in a bedside book. Well, what is suitable for reading in bed and what is not suitable for reading in bed? I don't know. Next is bedside manner. Two words, noun from 1848. The manner that a physician assumes toward patients. They should have some good bedside manner because if they don't, that's not great for the patient and the family. And I think they, they, have to, they have to really learn that and train because it is not a natural skill necessarily. Next is bed sitter. Uh, there's a hyphen between the two words. Noun from 1899. It is British. A one-room apartment serving as both bedroom and sitting room. Called also bed sit or bed sitting room. Which, by the way, is three words with two hyphens. So this is from uh, the word, the term bed sitting room plus the suffix er as in refresher, which is freshman, or rugger, which is rugby. The, the, I'm a little confused because I'm not British, but that's how the British say things. Now we have bed sore. It is a noun from 1826. An ulceration of tissue deprived of adequate blood supply by prolonged pressure, called also decubitus ulcer. Sharon, did I say that right? Decubitus? Yeah. Oh, I said it right, sweet. Uh, those sound bad. If you are laying in bed for a very long time, you could get bed sores, so you have to move around every once in a while. So don't do that. Next is bed spread. It is a noun from 1820, a usually ornamental cloth cover for a bed. Next is bed spring, noun from 1858, a spring supporting a mattress. Next is bedstead, B-E-D-S-T-E-A-D. It is a noun from the 15th century, the framework of a bed. Middle English, bedstead, uh, S-T-E-D-E, from bed plus stead, which means stead. That's the S-T-E-A-D version. Um, also means place. And there's more at the word stead. Next is bed straw. That is not the thing that you would use to stick into a waterbed to drink the water, because that would be weird. This is something else. It is a noun from 1527. Any of a genus of herbs of the matter family having squarish stems, whorled leaves, and small flowers. And the scientific name is gallium, with one L. And this is, uh, the etymology comes from its use for mattresses. So back in the day, in 1527-ish, they would use these bed straws and put them in mattresses, and that's how it became the bed straw. Next, we have bed table. Two words, noun from 1811. One, an adjustable table used, as for eating or writing, by a person in bed. Number two, a small table beside a bed. Next is bedtime. Why can't that be now? It is a noun from the 13th century, a time for going to bed. You all probably have slightly different, or most of you, have slightly different bedtimes right now because of the quarantine. I know I do. I've definitely been going to bed later than I used to and waking up later than I used to. Um, but I think I'm going to try to get back into a slightly more normal schedule, uh, try and be a little bit more productive in the mornings, maybe do some stretches or something. Next is bedtime story. Two words, noun from 1868. A story read or recounted to someone as a child at bedtime. What's your bedtime story? 
Um, I just learned actually that my cousin and his daughter wrote a kid's book. I don't know if it would be good for bedtime story, but it might be. Um, maybe I will actually, uh, they, it's only on Kindle right now, but maybe I'll put a link to that in the episode description. Uh, I'm very excited for them. That's really awesome. Uh, next we have Bedou. No, Bedou. I think the emphasis is on the first syllable. B-E-D-U. It is a noun, often capitalized, from 1871. Um, and this is related to the word Bedouin from last episode. Uh, so, and that's what it is. That's the synonym is Bedouin. So this is from the Arabic word B-A-D-W, which means desert or desert dweller. I want to be a dessert dweller. Next is bed warmer, two words, noun from 1740, a covered pan containing hot colds used to warm a bed. Thankfully, we don't, most of us don't need things like that anymore. Next is bed wedding. Two words with a hyphen. Noun from 1890. Enuresis, especially when occurring in bed during sleep. Uh, Enuresis is E-N-U-R-E-S-I-S. I I hope I said that correctly. Um, And then bed wetter is a noun. Next is the word B. B B-E-E. It is the first form of three, and it is a noun from before the 12th century. Number one, any of numerous hymenopterous insects that differ from the related wasps, especially in the heavy, he- heavier, hairier body and in having sucking as well as chewing mouth parts that feed on pollen and nectar and that store both and often also honey. Excuse me. I ate a bee. I had to get rid of it. Uh, And then it says, wow, you can see the synonyms for lots of different synonyms in this book. Africanized bee, bumblebee, carpenter bee, honey bee, and sweat bee. What's a sweat bee? Uh, I think I said hymenopterus correctly. I'll have to look up what that means. Uh, And then we have number two, an eccentric notion. Synonym is fancy. Bee-like is an adjective. And bee in one's bonnet it doesn't have the full definition, but it just has the number two definition for the first form of B, which is what we just read, an eccentric notion or fancy. Uh, yeah, I think I'm reading that correctly. Um, I might have to put a clip in from They Might Be Giants, Birdhouse in Your Soul, because they say be in, one's, be in your bonnet, I think is what they say. Not to put too fine a point on it, say I'm the only... So this is Middle English from Old English B-O, B-E-O, which is akin to the Old High German Bia, which means B, from Old Irish Bech or Beck, B-E-C-H, and from the Lithuanian Bitis, B-I-T-I-S. I mentioned this before, but uh, bee stings suck. I'm sure most of you have probably been stung by a bee. Uh, I hope you're not allergic to them, but yeah, they, they don't feel so good. Next, we have... The second form of B, it is a noun from the 14th century, and the definition just says the letter B. Now we have the third form of B. It is a noun from 1769, a gathering of people for a specific purpose, as in a quilting B. This is perhaps from the, what is the letter E? Is it Ethiopian? Is it Equatorian? I don't know. I'm just making up words now. I have to go back to um, this page that I still have not marked off. E. E is... Oh, it's East or Eastern or English. So, I'm assuming it's English in this uh, context. Perhaps from the English dialect, bean, B-E-E-N, or you could say bin, which means help given by neighbors... Uh, from the Middle English, B-E-N-E, which means prayer, or boon, from the Old English, ben, which means prayer, and there's more at the word boon. Interesting. Next, we have B, all caps, abbreviation for Bachelor of Electrical Engineering. Next is B, balm, B-A-L-M, noun from 1836, one, any of several, monardos. What's a monardos? M-O-N-A-R-D-A-S, especially the synonym 
Oswego tea. And then number two, we have the synonym lemon balm. Next is the word be bread. All one word, noun from 1657. Bitter, yellowish brown pollen stored up in honeycomb cells and used mixed with honey by bees as food. Next is beech, B E E C H, noun from before the 12th century. Any of a genus of hardwood trees with smooth gray bark and small edible nuts. Also, it's wood. Beechen is an adjective. Uh, so this etymology says it's from Middle English bech, from Old English beke, akin to um, the Old English bok, which means beech, from Old High German boha, b-o, no, b-u-o-h-h-a, that's a fun word to say, boha, although I don't think I'm saying it correctly, from the Latin fagus, from the Greek figos, which means oak. Now we have beech drops, one word. Noun from 1813, a plant. Oh, I forgot to say that the uh, the genus name for beech is Fagus of the family Fagaceae, which is the beech family. So then beech drops. It is a plant of the broom rape family, parasitic on the roots of beeches. And that is beeches, B-E-E-C-H. And the scientific name for this plant is Epiphagus virginiana. I wonder if they're from the state of Virginia. Next is beech nut, one word, noun from 1661, the nut of the beech. And then our last word for this episode is bee eater, B-E-E hyphen E-A-T-E-R. It is a noun from 1668, any of a family of brightly colored, slender-billed, insectivorous, uh, chiefly tropical old world birds. And the scientific name is Meropidae. That was all the words. Uh, I need to pick one that I want to say is the word of the episode. Um, We will pick bed sore as the word of the episode because I want to make sure that you all are aware to try to not get bed sores. Sometimes you can't control it. If you're in a hospital, you might not be able to move by yourself, but hopefully your nurses are moving you so you don't get bed sores. You got something something to say about bed sores? I treated a lot of people in nursing school with bed sores, and it's pretty it's pretty sad. I feel bad for them. They can get pretty bad down to the bone. So, and I'm I assume they're painful. Extremely painful, yeah. So don't get bed sores. That's the point of this one. Uh, that is it. I am the dispenser of words to you. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. It's the podcast that you're listening to right now. The first word is beef, B-E-E-F. It is the first form. It is a noun from the 13th century. One, the flesh. Mm, Good start. The flesh of an adult domestic bovine as a steer or cow used as food. To A, an ox, cow, or bull in a full-grown or nearly full-grown state, especially a steer or cow fattened for food, as in quality Texas beeves. So that looks like it's the, one of the plural forms is B-E-E-V-E-S. The other plural form is just adding an S. Also as in a herd of good beef. To be a dressed carcass of a beef animal. Number three, Muscular flesh. Synonym is brawn. And then number four is the synonym complaint. Like, I got a beef with you, buddy. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into this. I'm just going to mention it once at the beginning of this episode. I have mentioned in the past I am vegan, so you know I'm putting aside my personal feelings on this word and most of the words in this episode, uh, but you know, just, just wanted to throw that out there. The etymology of this says it is from Anglo-French B-E-O-F or B-E-F, which means ox or beef. From the Latin bov, that's a prefix, or boss, which means head of cattle. And there's more at the word cow. Uh, There is a picture, uh, actually two pictures, of the various cuts of beef. 
Um, you can, that would be for the 2B definition. Um, I'll list them, but I'm not going to describe where they are. You can, if you're curious, you can find this somewhere. Um, let's see. Uh, number one is a shank. Number two, round with rump and shank cut off. Number three, rump. Number four, sirloin. Five, short loin. Six, flank. Seven, rib. Eight, chuck. Nine, plate. Ten, brisket. Eleven, shank. Oh, and that was, so that was on the one side and then the other side. It, oh, those are the retail cuts. The first ones were the wholesale cuts. So then on the retail cuts, A, is heel pot roast, B is round steak, C is rump roast, B is sirloin steak, E is pin bone steak, F is short ribs, G is porterhouse, H is T-bone, I club steak, J flank steak, K rib roast, L blade rib roast, M plate, N brisket, O cross cut shank, P arm pot roast, Q, boneless neck, and R is blade roast. Uh, but I do recommend that everybody try some vegan meats. There is a whole lot of good ones out there. Now we have the second form of beef. It is a transitive verb from 1860. To increase or add substance, strength, or power to. Usually used with the word up. As in, money to beef up its staff of professional economists. And that is a quote from John Fisher. That was the transitive verb. Now we have the intransitive definition. Synonym is complain, just like in the other one. Uh, as in, always beefing about something. Now we have beefalo, B-E-E-F-A-L-O. It is a noun from 1973. Any of a breed of beef cattle developed in the U.S. that is genetically three-eighths Northern North American bison and five eighths domestic bovine. So this is a combination of beef and buffalo. It is a beefalo. Next is beefcake. Noun from 1949. A usually photographic display of muscular male physiques. Also, a man of the type featured in such a such a display or such men in general. Compare to the synonym cheesecake. I have a feeling that's the opposite of beefcake. Uh, where would I put myself? Probably leaning towards the cheesecake side. Uh, every time I hear the word beefcake, I think of the South Park episode where Cartman wants to be a beefcake. Next, we have beef cattle. Two words, noun from 1758. A cattle. Didn't know there's no letter A. It just says cattle developed primarily for the efficient production of meat and marked by capacity for rapid growth, heavy, well-fleshed body, and stocky build. Next is beef eater. One word. I learned about this one a while ago, and I was I was pretty interested. Uh, but you'll you'll learn about it now. This is a noun from 1671. Number one, a yeoman. I'm not sure of the pronunciation of that. Y-E-O-M-A-N, a yeoman of the guard that forms part of the English monarch's train on state occasions. Number two, a warder of the Tower of London uniformed like a beef eater. So there's beef eater gin, and on the label they have a picture of one of these uh, one of these guards. Um, in their beef eater uniform, and I, uh, I visited London years ago, and I went to the Tower of London. Uh, this was actually when the uh, the Icelandic volcano erupted, and I was actually stuck in London. Um, it uh, let me see if I can pronounce the Icelandic volcano is Eyjafjallajökull, something like that. And um, I went to the Tower of London, which was not on the uh, original schedule, but because I was stranded, I, I went. And uh, there are these guys walking around in this beef eater costume. And it's not a costume, it's their uniform. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And then they made gin? I don't know the connection of that. Anyway, now we have B, fly, two words. Well, that's, that's a, that's, it's a paradox. It's an oxymoron. B, fly? Uh, it is a noun from 1751. Ooh, my wife just set down a plate of vegan donuts next to me because she's taking a picture because today is the uh, 30th anniversary of the first episode airing of Twin Peaks. 
Uh, and of course, coffee and donuts are a big part of that show. Anyway, uh, B fly, noun from 1751, any of a family of dipteron flies, many of which resemble bees. And the family name is Bombalidae. B O M B Y L I I D A E. I'm sure I butchered that pronunciation. Next is beef steak, not beef cake, beef steak. It is a noun from circa 1706, a steak of beef, usually from the hind quarter. Next is beefsteak tomato, two words, noun from 1869, a very large globe-shaped red tomato with dense flesh. Next is, I think we'll just, I think this will be the last episode. No, the last word of the episode, beef stroganoff. Beef is the normal word, second word, capital S, T R O G A. N-O-F-F. It is a noun from 1932. Beef sliced thin and cooked in a sour cream sauce. This is probably from stroganoff, with a V at the end instead of two Fs, which is the surname of a prominent line of Russian nobility. So, I think I am going to have to pick... Hmm... I'm going to pick bee fly as the word of the episode. I hope you are all doing well. Uh, let's see. Today is April 12th. So I screwed up these holidays. I was actually accidentally looking at March. So I had to do some, some pickups, some editing to fix my mistakes. Uh, I hope they went unnoticed, but then I just told you about them now. Uh, oh, today's Easter Sunday, uh, which, you know, some people celebrate. Uh, so that is it. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Also, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the podcast called the dictionary. How are you all doing? I hope you are doing wonderfully. Uh, I got nothing to say except the first word is beef Wellington beef. And then the second word is Wellington with a capital B. This is a noun from 1930. A fillet of beef, or is it a fillet? I've heard both. I think it depends on the spelling. This is F-I-L-L-E-T. But I'm going to say a fillet of beef covered with pâté de foie gras and baked in a casing of pastry. And this is probably from the name Wellington. Well, whose name Wellington? Is it a first name? Is it a last name? Was there somebody named Wellington who made this thing and then somehow they got this named after them? I want something named after me. Next, we have beef wood, all one word, noun from 1805. One, the hard, heavy, reddish wood of any of various chiefly Australian trees. Number two, we have the synonym Australian pine. Next is beefy. It is an adjective from 1743. 1A, heavily and powerfully built, as in a beefy thug. 1B, synonyms are substantial and sturdy, as in beefy shock absorbers. Number two, uh, 2A, of or suggesting beef, as in a beefy flavor. 2B, full of beef as in a beefy steak. Next, we have beehive, noun from the 14th century. One, we just have the number one definition for the word hive. Number two, something resembling a hive for bees, as to a, a scene of crowded activity. Well, you don't find many of those these days, if you are listening to this during our quarantine time in 2020. Uh, you could also be listening to this 15 years in the future after I finish this whole thing. In which case, welcome to the past. How's the future? Weird? Probably. Cool. To be a woman's hairdo that is conical in shape. Beehive is also an adjective. Next we have beehive oven. Two words. Noun from 1872. An arched oven used especially for baking food and formerly for coking coal. Not cooking, coking with one O. Next is beekeeper. Noun from 1783. A person who raises bees. And beekeeping is a noun. Next is beeline. One word and it is the first form. Uh, it is a noun from 1830. A straight, direct course. 
And this is from the belief that nectar-laden bees return to their hives in a direct line. Uh, that's uh, pretty interesting. Uh, I like I like seeing etymology that is so specific like that. Whether or not it's true, I don't know, but you'd think it would be. You'd think that a bee would want to make as direct a line as possible back to its hive. If it's got nectar, it wants to get it back to the hive for the queen and for the babies and for food and all that. Uh, all right, now we have the second form of bee line. It is a tr- um, an intransitive verb from 1882, to go quickly in a straight, direct course. Next is Beelzebub. So the pronunciation and the spelling don't totally make sense to me, although it does look like one of the correct pronunciations is Beelzebub, uh, or Be- Beelzebub, which makes more sense. It is capital B E E L Z E. B-U-B. So you could say Beelzebub, Beelzebub, or Belzebub. It is a noun from before the 12th century. Number one, we just have the synonym devil. Number two, a fallen angel in Milton's Paradise Lost, ranking next to Satan. So they're not the same person, they're different people? Okay. Uh, this is from Beelzebub, which is the prince, uh, I'm looking at the etymology now, the prince of devils from the Latin word, I guess, Beelzebub, from the Greek word Beelzebub, B-O-U-B, from the Hebrew Baalzebub, oh, do I want to spell it? Okay, B-A apostrophe A-L, next word, Z-E-B-H-U-B-H. And that is a Philistine god, literally, Lord of the Flies. Hmm, interesting. Next, we have bin, B-E-E-N. It, it, is, it is the past participle of the word be, B-E. Next is beep. Uh, it is the first form. It is a verb from 1936, to cause, as a horn, to sound. And then the intransitive definition says, uh, oh, there's two of them. Number one, to sound a horn. And number two, to make a beep. Uh, And I love, um, you know, the roadrunner goes, meep, meep. That's sort of a meep, not a beep, but it's still a beep. Next, we have the second form of beep. It is a noun from 1943, a short, usually high-pitched sound, as from a horn or an electronic device, that serves as a signal or warning. Next is beeper. All you young kids today probably don't know what a beeper is. It's a noun from 1970, and the synonym is pager. Well, does that help? Not particularly, unless we go to the word uh, the, the word pager, but we're not going to do that today. But specifically, one that beeps. So a specifically, a pager that beeps. Next, we have the word beer, many people's favorite word ever, probably, maybe. It is a noun from before the 12th century. It is an old word. Number one, an alcoholic beverage, usually made from malted cereal grain, as barley, flavored with hops, and brewed by slow fermentation. I'm not a big beer fan. Um, I like the sweeter things, as I think I've mentioned before, but I especially don't like hops. Uh, it's the, the bitterness is a thing that does not sit well with my taste buds and my brain. Number two, a carbonated non-alcoholic or a fermented slightly alcoholic beverage with flavoring from roots or other plant parts, as in beer, uh, no, birch beer. I mixed up the words. Um, And then, you know, I think related to that would be root beer, which I love because it's sweet. Now we have number three, fermented mash. And number four, a drink of beer. So this is Middle English from the word bear or beer with only one E from the Old English beor, which is B-E-O-R. And it is akin to the Old High German beor, B-I-O-R, which means beer. Next is a fun one, beer and Skittles. It is three separate words, just like it sounds. Noun from 1855, a situation of agreeable ease, as in, won't be all beer and Skittles. Uh, It does not tell me, but I really, really, really want to look at the etymology of this because 
beer and Skittles don't typically go together in my brain, so I want to know why um, that happened. How did this become a thing, a phrase, beer and Skittles? But I might have to start using that. Next is beer belly, two words, noun from 1829. We have the synonym pot belly. And then beer bellied with a hyphen is an adjective. Next is beer goggles, two words, noun from 1987. The effects of alcohol thought of metaphorically as a pair of goggles that alter a person's perceptions, especially by making other others appear more attractive than they actually are. I think many, many people have... Uh, Fun, fun stories of having beer goggles and uh, not being fully aware of what's going on. Next is Beer Pong, noun from 1972, a game in which a set of beer-containing cups is placed at two ends of a table and in which a player scores by bouncing or tossing a ping-pong ball into an opponent's cup from which the opponent then has to drink the beer. I love that there is a very standard sterile definition of beer pong which is all about just getting drunk and wasted in a very fun way um i as i mentioned i'm not a beer fan but i have played beer pong i was willing to drink a little bit just because i love games i love ping pong and you know the idea of just trying to throw a, a ping pong ball into a cup is just a fun challenge uh and so i, I have played that once or twice um and I thought I had something else, but uh, I don't. Oh, I also just think it's funny that this has become such a normal thing. Not only is it in the dictionary, but there's there are app games for beer pong, and it's I don't. It's just become a um, a very big thing around America and probably the world too. It's not this thing that only college kids play. All right, next we have beery adjective from 1764. Uh, and I just think it's funny that there are extra forms, beerier and beeriest. That beer is beerier than that beer, even though that beer is pretty beery, but that beer over there, it's the beeriest. Number one, affected or caused by beer, as in beery voices. Number two, smelling or tasting of beer, as in beery tavern. Next we have bee's knees. B-E-E apostrophe S, second word, knees. Noun from 1921, a highly admired person or thing. And a synonym is cat's meow. Something that is, uh, you know, if you if you were not using those phrases back in the day, uh, or, you know, if you're not familiar with them, having that synonym isn't really going to help you. But that's what they are, a highly admired person or thing. And last for this episode, and this might... No, it does not go on to this next page. It is bee stings. B-E-E-S-T-I-N-G-S. Um, and it looks like it could also be spelled with a B-E-A. Okay, this is a noun from before the 12th century. And it says, the colostrum, especially of a cow. So it's not... Bee stings, it's bee stings. Interesting. Um, and I, this is reminding me of the, we came across this word, the one with the B-E-A spelling. And I said, oh, it looks, and it sounds like bee stings, but it's not. But then I said it was, uh, and I can't find it. That's okay. The etymology says this is from bee sting, B-E-S-T-Y-N-G-E, from Old English, by sting, B-Y, and then the word sting, from biost, which means bee stings, akin to the old high German biost, which is bee stings. What is the colostrum of a cow, or especially of a cow? I don't know. We'll get to that in the seas. So my favorite word from this episode has got to be beer and skittles, which again is a situation of agreeable ease. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, maybe I should tell you another podcast I'm listening to just because I like giving them more exposure if it's something that people haven't heard. Uh, and I don't remember where I left off. So I'm going to just say Star Talk Radio with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Go listen, go learn something. This has been Spencer dispensing information into your brain. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of this podcast called The Dictionary. Yes, we are at the top of page 110. 110. It is amazingly 
the the page that's before 111. First word is be stung. B E E hyphen S T U N G. It is it is in N. It is an adjective from 1822. Having a red puffy appearance as if from being stung by a bee, as in bee stung lips. Uh, those, my personal opinion is those can look kind of weird. You, you, you Google bee stung lips and you're bound to find some funky pictures. Next is beeswax. Noun from 1655. And we have the number one definition for the word wax. Next is beet. Noun from before the 12th century. A biennial garden plant of the goosefoot family that includes several cultivars and that has thick, edible leaves with long petioles and often swollen purplish-red roots. Also, its root used especially as a vegetable, as a source of sugar, and for forage. The scientific name for this biennial garden plant is Beta vulgaris, and in parentheses it says after, let's see, includes several cultivars as Swiss chard and sugar beet. So those are a couple examples. Uh, beets are pretty healthy for you. Uh, you know, you m- maybe don't want to eat them every single day, like uh, Dwight from The Office, but uh, they are good for you on occasion, and it might turn your pee kind of red. Uh, so don't don't freak out. Don't, don't be scared. Uh, it is a very common occurrence if you have some beets. Anyway, we're going to move on to beet armyworm. Armyworm is one word. And then beet is its own word. Noun from 1894. An army worm that typically eats the foliage of beets, alfalfa, and vegetables. And the scientific name is Spadoptera, or it's probably pronounced Spadoptera exigua. I love scientific names. I have no idea what they mean, though. Next is beetle. B-E-E. T-L-E. It is the first form. Noun from before the 12th century. Um, I'm looking, did I miss some etymology? No, I think we're good. Number one, any of an order of insects having four wings of which the outer pair are modified into stiff elytra that protect the inner pair when at rest. Number two, any of various insects resembling a beetle. That word elytra, I've never never seen that before. E-L-Y-T-R-A. I hope I pronounced it correctly. This is from Middle English, betil, B-E-T-Y-L-L-E, from the Old English, betula, akin to bitan, which means to bite. So, beetles bite. Uh, They don't necessarily all bite, though, but that's where the word came from, it looks like. Now we have the second form of beetle. It is a verb, uh, specifically an intransitive verb, from circa 1919, to scurry like a beetle, as in... Editors beetled around the office. And now we have the third form of beetle. It is an adjective from the 14th century. Being prominent and overhanging. As in, oh, I think I skipped a couple of lines. Let's try that one again. The third form of beetle is a noun from before the 12th century. One, a heavy wooden hammering or ramming instrument. Number two, a wooden pestle or bat for domestic tasks. Uh, this is from Middle English, betel, from Old English, bietel, akin to the Old English, bietan, which means to beat. Now we have the fourth form of beetle. This was the one that I started to read accidentally. It is an adjective from the 14th century, being prominent and overhanging, as in beetle brows. Whoa, so if you've got, like, really... Oh, so Eugene Levy, would his eyebrows be considered beetle brows? Because they look like beetles? I don't know. that They don't at all. Uh, this is from Middle English, bittle browed, which means having overhanging brows. Uh, probably from bittile or bittle, which means beetle. And now we have the fifth form of beetle. It is an intransitive verb. Man, I screwed that whole thing up. I went, I bounced around all these different forms of beetles. All right, this is an intransitive verb from 1602. The synonyms are project, or is it project? No, I think it's project. 
and jut, J-U-T, as in to scale the beetling crags. And that is a quote from R.L. Stevenson. All right, enough. Oh, I wanted to say about the word beetle, uh, the, the band, the Beatles, you may have noticed they don't spell it like the insect beetle. They actually spell it B-E-A-T-L-E. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, the story is that John Lennon saw in a dream that their band name would be the Beatles with an A. Uh, I don't know how true that is. Um, I could be messing it up. But anyway, that's the, uh, that's the story. All right, now we have beat leafhopper. Two words, leafhopper is one word. It is a noun from 1906. A leafhopper that transmits, transmits, yep, transmits curly top virus to sugar beets and other garden plants. And the scientific name for this leafhopper is Circulifer tenellis. Next is B, tree, two words, noun from 1773, a hollow tree in which honeybees nest. Next is beet root, one word, noun from 1579. It is chiefly British, and it means a beet grown for its edible, usually red root. Also, the root. So the root is just called beet root. Next is beeves, B-E-E-V-E-S, and this is just the plural of the word beef, which we read a couple of episodes ago. Now is bee yard, one word, noun from uh, the 15th century, and we just have the synonym apiary. An apiary is a bee yard. Next is the abbreviation BEF, B-E-F, or beef. Um, and it's just an abbreviation for the word before. Now we have BEF again, but this one is all caps. It is an abbreviation for British Expeditionary Force. Expeditionary Force, yeah. Next is befall. It is a verb from the 13th century. First is intransitive. To happen, especially as if by fate. And then the transitive definition says to happen to as in, the fate that befell them. That would be the past tense form, befell. Now we have befit. It is a verb from the 15th century. Only, uh, we just have one transitive definition. To be proper or becoming to, as in, clothing that befits the occasion. I like to wear clothes that do not befit the occasion. No, that's not true. I'm a little bit too embarrassed to do that. But in my mind, I want to do things like that. I want to wear a tux to a fast food restaurant if I were to actually go to fast food restaurants. But I feel I would be embarrassed. Okay, next is befitting. It is an adjective from circa 1612. Number one, we just have the synonyms suitable and appropriate. Number two, synonyms are proper and decent. Befittingly is an adverb. Next is befog. It is a verb from 1601. We have two transitive definitions. The first one just has the synonym confuse, and then the second one has the synonyms fog and obscure. Next is befool. It's the word fool with B-E at the front. It is a transitive verb from the 14th century. One, to make a fool of. And then number two, we have the number one definition for the word delude. I often befool myself. All right, now we have the last word of this episode. We are going to to do two forms. The word is before, B-E-F-O-R-E. And then the third form will be in the next episode. So, first form, it is an adverb or an adjective from before the 12th century. Number one, in advance, and then a synonym is ahead, as in marching on before, marching on before. And then number two, at an earlier time, as in the night before, also as in knew her before. And let's see, the etymology isn't terribly interesting. So we're going to move on to the second form of before. It is a preposition from before the 12th century. 1A1, uh, forward of or in front of, as in stood before the fire. 1A2, in the presence of, 
as in speaking before the conference. 1b. Under the jurisdiction or consideration of, as in the case before the court. 1c1. At the disposal of, as in the great sums placed before him. 1c2. In store for, as in got the whole summer before you. Oh, isn't that great when you're a kid? When you're an adult and you have a job, you don't get a summer, usually, unless you're a teacher or something. Number two, preceding in time, earlier than, as in, just before noon. Well, that would be 159. No, 1159. I'm so stupid. Number three, in a higher or more important position than, as in, put quantity before quality. Hmm, I think... I would prefer to do it the other way around, and I hope you all do too. What is the word of the episode? I think we are going to pick the word that is the one called Beat Army Worm, just because I think that's kind of a funny phrase, a funny mixture of words together. All right, that is it for this episode. I appreciate you joining me during this quarantine. I hope that you are all doing well and you are staying clean and washing hands. And at this point, wearing masks. If you go outside or go to a store especially, you really should be wearing a mask and it should be prepared correctly and there should be no space between the mask and your skin. And, you know, it's life is weird right now. All right, I'm going to end this episode. This has been Spencer dispensing information into your brain. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, you lovely word nerds. I hope that you, I don't even know what I'm trying to say here. Just do good. Be good. This is a daily podcast. I have to do these uh, every day. There's a lot of them. I'm trying to figure out new things to say. Um, if you like this podcast, go share it and rate and review and do all the things. And if you want to say something to me about how much you hate this podcast or how much you love this podcast or how much you think I should do things better or different, go ahead and let me know. All of the contact information is in the episode description. Uh, I, I should be keeping track of what day number this is of the quarantine. Let's see. I think it was one, two, I'm looking at my calendar, three. I think that was the first day of quarantine. No. One two, three, that day. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. I think this is day 20 for me. Day 20 in Illinois. Anyway, let's say some words. The first word is before, B-E-F-O-R-E. It is the third form. It is a conjunction from the 13th century, 1A1, earlier than the time that. Those definitions are weird when they just end with the word that. I get so confused. Uh, All right. As in, call me before you go. And 1A2, sooner or quicker than. As in, I'll be done before you know it. 1A3, so that, dot, 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 do not. That's a weird definition. So that, dot, 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 do not. As in, get out of there before you get dirty. Something that somebody probably said to a kid or an animal, and if it's a different situation than that, I have questions. Now we have 1B, until time that, as in, miles to go before I sleep, and that is a quote from Robert Frost, probably from a poem. 1C1, or else, dot, 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 not, or else, dot, 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 not, yes, that's what it says, as in, must be convicted before he can be removed from office. Interesting. Now we have 1C2, or else, as in, get out of here before I call a cop. Well, who says before I call a cop? Wouldn't you just say before I call the cops or the police? Before I call a cop? Okay. Number two, rather or sooner than, as in, would starve before he'd steal. That's a very nice person. Now we have the word beforehand. It is an adverb or an adjective from the 13th century. 1A, in anticipation. 1B, in advance. Number two, ahead of time. Synonym is early. That's how I like to be. I like to be early. If I'm not on time, no. If I'm not early, I'm late. Now we have before long. Two words. Adverb from 1585. In the near future, synonym is soon. Soon 
we will not be in quarantine. I am saying that optimistically. Now we have before time, one word, adverb from the 13th century. This one is archaic, and we just have the synonym formerly. Now we have befoul, transitive verb from the 12th century. Number one, to make foul, as with dirt or waste. Number two, synonyms, three of them, sully, soil, besmirch, as in scandal befouled his reputation. Sometimes scandal does not befoul people's reputations, and that becomes a problem. Now we have befriend. It is a transitive verb from 1559, to become or act as a friend to. Next is befuddle. This one is a transitive verb from 1801. Number one, to muddle or stupefy with or as if with drink. So basically to make drunk. Number two, synonyms are confuse and perplex. Befuddlement is a noun and a great word. Now we have the word beg. B-E-G. It is the first form. This one has uh, a bunch of definitions and a bunch of synonym information. This one is a verb from the 13th century. We are starting with the transitive definitions. One, to ask for as a charity. Two, A, to ask earnestly for. Synonym is entreat. Two, B, to require as necessary or appropriate. Three, Synonyms are evade and sidestep, as in begged the real problems. Now we have the intransitive definitions. One, to ask for alms. Two, to ask earnestly, as in begged for mercy. We have a phrase, beg the question, and there are two definitions. Number one, to pass over or ignore a question by assuming it to be established or settled. Number two, to elicit a question logically as a reaction or response, as in, the quarterback's injury begs the question of who will start in his place. Here's the synonym information. Beg, entreat, beseech, implore, supplicate, adjure, importune. No, what? This word goes over to the second line. Importune. That one is spelled I M. P-O-R-T-U-N-E, importune. So all of those words mean to ask urgently. Beg suggests earnestness or insistence in the asking, as in, they begged for help. Entreat implies an effort to persuade or to overcome resistance, as in, entreated me to join them. Beseech and implore imply a deeply felt anxiety, as in, I beseech I beseech you to have mercy. Also as in, or the other word has the example, implored her not to leave. Supplicate suggests a posture of humility, as in, with bowed heads they supplicated their Lord. Adjure implies advising as well as pleading, as in, we were adjured to tell the truth. To tell the truth. I did not enunciate those words. Import, importune suggests an annoying persistence in trying to break down resistance, as in importuning viewers for donations. I hope I'm saying that word correctly. Now we have the second form of beg. Don't worry, it's short. It is an abbreviation for begin or beginning. Next is beget or beget, B-E-G-E-T. It is a verb I think it's just transitive. Yep, just transitive from the 13th century. And um, with the verbs, I usually skip this information, but sometimes I I read it. Um, They say the other forms, like, uh, let's see if I can find a quick example of something else. So beg is a verb. The other forms are begged and begging. Or sometimes, like, if it's an adjective, it'll say, like, uh, what was the one that I had recently? Beery, beerier, beeriest. Anyway, so the other forms for beget could be begot, begat, begotten, begot, or begetting. And I think all of those have their place. All right, number one, to procreate as the father. Synonym is sire. Number two, to produce, especially as an effect or outgrowth. 
begitter is a noun. That is the one who is doing the begetting. And um, there's not a lot of information in the uh, etymology. I'm... I, th- I kind of want to look up more about, you know, where this came from. It came from the word get, uh, you know, the one that we are aware of, get. Um, and then, yeah. But this is an old word because I know it's in the Bible. I've read the first, like, paragraph, and that's about it. Um, all right, now we have the word beggar, B-E-G-G-A-R. It is the first form noun from the 13th century. One, one that begs, especially a person who lives by asking for gifts. Number two, synonym is pauper. Number three, we have the 4C definition for the word fellow. And now we have the second form of beggar. It is a verb from the 15th century, only transitive. Number one, to reduce to beggary. Number two, to exceed the resources or abilities of. Synonym is defy, as in beggar's description. Also as in, so outrageous as to beggar belief. Now we have the word beggarly. This is an interesting word. It is an adjective from 1526. Number one, contemptibly mean, scant, petty, or paltry. Number two, befitting or resembling a beggar, especially marked by extreme poverty. Beggarliness is a noun. It says it's an adjective. Usually when I see words that end in L-Y, I think they're adverbs. But uh, yeah, I mean, it could be an adjective too. All right, next is a phrase. And um, what's interesting is that we're going to have four of these sort of similarly laid out phrases. Uh, We're only going to do two in this episode. The first one is beggar my neighbor. So it is the word beggar hyphen my hyphen. And the neighbor is spelled B-O-U-R because this is the British spelling. It is an adjective from 1815. Like I said, it is chiefly British. And it is... Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. Um, Yeah, it's just uh, the beggar thy neighbor is the American English way to say it. Beggar thy neighbor, which will be the first word of the next episode. So I'm sorry if you are impatient to learn about what beggar thy neighbor means. But now we have beggar's lice, beggar with an apostrophe S hyphen lice, L-I-C-E. Could also just be beggar lice. This is a noun from 1835, any of various plants with prickly or adhesive fruits, also one of these fruits. So in parentheses, it says, as of the genera Hekelia and Cynoglossum. Of the borage family or barrage family. Uh, so that is a plant called beggar's lice. And I'm just looking ahead. Yes, the second word of the next episode is similar, uh, but we'll get there later. Anyway, what is the word of the episode? The word of the episode is going to be befuddle because I like that word. Thank you very much for listening. Um, another podcast I'm listening to is Conan Needs a Friend. It's Conan O'Brien's podcast, and uh, he is. He is very funny. I've actually never really watched his show, um, but uh, yeah, I just don't have time. But his podcast is great, and his banter with his co-hosts is great, and his guests are great, and they have a good time, and it's just pure silliness. If you want just pure silliness, 95% of the time, go listen to that podcast. It's great. And uh, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate all of you for listening, for tuning in, for tuning your radio to the podcast channel called The Dictionary, and uh, I'm going to end this. Thank you for listening. This has been Spencer Dispenser. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. You are the greatest people in the world, and I am here to welcome you to my podcast called The Dictionary. Are you a new person? I don't think I've said this for a while. If you are new to this podcast, go back to the beginning. Start from there. If you don't want to, You will be terribly confused and you will miss a lot of really amazing content. The first word for this episode is beggar thy neighbor. B-E-G-G-A-R hyphen T-H-Y hyphen N-E-A no N-E-I-G-H B-O-R. This is an adjective from 1945 relating to or being an action or policy 
that produces gains for one group at the expense of another, as in, followed beggar thy neighbor, but they can't talk today, followed beggar thy neighbor policies in imposing taxes. And if you remember from the last episode, see, this is why you need to listen to all of them in order. Last episode, we had beggar thy neighbor with a uh, the British version, beggar my neighbor, and this is beggar thy neighbor. Next is beggar ticks with a hyphen, and this is, oh, it could also be beggar's ticks with an apostrophe S. This is a noun from circa 1818. Number one, synonym is burr marigold. Burr is spelled B-U-R. Also, it's prickly achines or achines, A-C-H-E-N-E-S. I, I must have read that at some point, but I don't remember what that word means. Uh, and then number two, we have the synonym beggar's lice, which was the last word of the last episode. Next is beggar weed, all one word, noun from 1787, uh, 1789. Boy, I feel like this quarantine is breaking my brain. I've been making a lot more mistakes in what I read, so apologies for that. I will try and get it together, man. All right, number one, any of various plants as not grass or daughter that grow in waste ground. Number two, any of several tick trifoils, especially a West Indian forage plant cultivated in the southern U.S., so the genus name for several tick trefoils is Desmodium, and then the scientific name for the West Indian forage plant looks like it is Desmodium tortuosum. Next we have beggary, noun from the 14th century. One synonyms are poverty and penury or penury, P-E-N-U-R-Y. Number two, the class of beggars. Number three, the practice of begging. Next is begin. Let us begin the word begin by saying it is a verb from before the 12th century. I just had some food, so I feel like there might be some burps in my future. Uh, we are going to start with the intransitive definitions. Number one, to do the first part of an action. Go into the first part of a process. Synonym is start. To A, to come into existence. Synonym is arise. To B, to have a starting point. Number three, to do or succeed in the least degree. As in, I can't begin to tell how pleased I am. Nope, I missed a word in there. I can't begin to tell you how pleased I am. Now we have the transitive definitions. Number one, to set about the activity of. Synonym, again, is start. To A, to bring into being. Synonym is found. To B, synonyms are originate and invent. The phrase to begin with means as the first thing to be considered. And the etymology we're going to skip, we have some more synonym information. Begin, commence, start, initiate, inaugurate, Usher in, mean to take the first step in a course, process, or op operation. Begin, start, and commence are often interchangeable. Begin, opposed to end, is the most general, as in, begin a trip. Also as in, began dancing. Start, opposed to stop, applies especially to first actions, steps, or stages, as in, the work started slowly. Commence can be more formal or bookish than begin or start, as in commence firing, also as in commenced a conversation. Initiate implies taking a first step in a process or series that is to continue, as in initiated diplomatic contacts. Inaugurate suggests a beginning of some formality or notion of significance, as in the discovery of penicillin inaugurated a new era of in medicine. There might be a sneeze, too. Here go. <coughs> Excuse me. Where were we? Inaugurate, blah to do as in the discovery of penicillin inaugurated a new era in medicine. Usher in 
is somewhat less weighty than inaugurate, as in ushered in a period of economic decline. Next is beginner. It is a noun from the 15th century, one that begins something, especially an inexperienced person. Now we have beginning. It is the first form, noun from the 12th century. One, the point at which something begins. Synonym is start. Number two, the first part. Number three, synonyms are origin and source. Number four, a rudimentary stage or early period, usually used in plural. Now we have the second form of beginning. It is an adjective from 1576. One, just starting out, as in a beginning writer, that is, the person who writes, W-R-I-T-E-R. 2A, being first or the first part, as in the beginning chapters. 2B, synonym is introductory, as in beginning chemistry. Next we have beginning rhyme, two words, noun from 1886, one Rhyme at the beginning of successive lines of verse. And number two, alliteration. So usually when we think of rhymes, we think of them happening at the end of words, but sometimes they can be at the beginning of words. Now we have begird, B-E-G-I-R-D. It is a verb from before the 12th century. Number one, synonym is the uh, 1A definition for the word gird. And number two, synonyms are surround and encompass. Uh, next is be glamour. Transitive verb from 1822, to impress or deceive with glamour. Next, and I think this is the last word for this episode, beg off. B-E-G, next word, O-F-F. It is a, a verb from 1788, to ask to be excused from something. And then the transitive definition, to ask or gain permission to be excused from, as in, begged off attending the party. Beg off with a hyphen is a noun. Um, well, we are going to pick uh, beggar ticks, I guess, as the word of the episode. Um, that is it for this episode. I hope you are all doing well still. I think this is day 21 for me or something in quarantine. I did leave the house today a couple of times to go get uh, toilet paper to do some shopping. Um, I had to go twice because we thought that they were getting their shipment in the morning, but they didn't, so I had to go in the afternoon. Anyway, I'm going to end this. Thank you very much for listening. This has been Spencer dispensing information to you, the lovely people who are listening to me yammer on. Uh, goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. This is the podcast where people say things, and I am that people. The first word is begoggled. B-E-G-O-G-G-L-E-D. This is an adjective from 1852. Wearing goggles, as in a helmeted, begoggled motorcycle rider. That's a fun word. Next is begone. Verb, uh, an intransitive verb from the 14th century, to go away, synonym is depart, used especially in the imperative, like, be gone, you evildoers, be gone, you nasty coronavirus. Next is begonia, noun from 1751, any of a large genus of tropical or subtropical herbs and shrubs that have asymmetrical leaves and are widely cultivated as ornamentals. So, this, let's see, the uh, genus name Begonia of the family Begoniaceae of the Begonia family. And the etymology says this is from Michel Begon, who died in 1710, French governor of Santo Domingo. So, Michel got a, a plant named, or an herb or shrub named after him. I assume it's a him. Could be a her, but it's probably a him. Next, we have Bagora. B-E-G-O-R-R-A. It is an interjection. Bogora from 1715. It is Irish, used as a mild, usually jocular oath. And it is a euphemism for the phrase, by God. So sometimes people will say, ah, by God, blah ba da But uh, in Irish, I guess they say Bogora. 
I want to find an example where somebody uses this. Next we have begrime. Could also be pronounced begrime. But the, uh, the, the emphasis is probably still on grime. Begrime. It is a transitive verb from circa 1556. One. To make dirty with grime. Why did I say that so weird? With grime. Number two. Synonyms are sully and corrupt. Next we have begrudge. Transitive verb from the 14th century. One. To give or concede reluctantly. Reluctantly, my mouth was reluctant to say that word, reluctantly or with displeasure, as in begrudge money. Also as in begrudge the week spent away from home. Oh, we do not have that problem right, right now. This is uh, the beginning of week four that I've been at home almost constantly. Uh, let's see, number two, to look upon with disapproval. As in, begrudge their rival's success. Begrudger is a noun, and begrudgingly is an adverb. Next is the word beguile. Ooh, beguile. It is a verb from the 13th century. One, to lead by deception. Number two, synonym is hoodwink. Number three, to while away, especially by some agreeable occupation. Also, the number two definition for the word divert. Number four, to engage the interest of, by, or as if by, guile, G-U-I-L-E. Now we have the intransitive definitions. I may have forgotten to say that those first ones were transitive. To deceive by wiles, W-I-L-E-S, not guile, but wiles. And then a synonym says, see the word deceive. Beguilement is a noun, beguiler is a noun, and beguilingly is an adverb. Next, we have the word beijing or beijing. I think it, I always get confused about the g and g, g, j sound, but I think this one is beijing. It is spelled B E G U I N E. It is the first form of two. It is a noun from the 15th century, a member of of one of various ascetic and philanthropic communities of women not under f- vows, fun- wow, it's, words are hard and vowels, um, uh, communities of women not under vows founded chiefly in the Netherlands in the 13th century. Interesting. Next, we have the second form of the same word, but it looks like it's pronounced begin or begin. I think it must be begin. Yeah, not not Jean. That sounds weird. Uh, spelled the same way. It is a noun from 1935. A vigorous, popular dance of the islands of St. Lucia and Martinique that somewhat resembles the rumba. Or uh, it's fun to say the rumba. This is American French, begin, from the French word begin, which means flirtation. Dancing can be very flirtatious. Now we have the word Begum or begum. It's B plus the word gum, like this chewing gum. It is a noun from 1617, a Muslim woman of high rank, as in India or Pakistan. Next, we have the word behalf or behalf. It is a noun from the 14th century. We have uh, some synonyms Inter- uh, interest, benefit, Also, support and defense, as in, argued in his behalf. It's interesting that there's no actual definition. It's just synonyms. Uh, Let's see. We have a phrase, on behalf of or in behalf of. On or in, doesn't matter. And that means in the interest of, also as a representative of. We have some usage information, something that we don't see too often. A body of opinion favors in with the interest-benefit sense of behalf, and on with the support or defense sense. So, quickly to backtrack, um, the synonyms interest and benefit are together, and then there was the word also, and then we have the synonym support and defense. So, what this is saying is that um, when you're using the, the context of interest or benefit, they like to use the word in, and then when you're using support or defense, They like to use the word on. This distinction has 
Blue, where's the line? This distinction has been observed by some writers, but overall has never had a sound basis in actual usage. In current British use, on behalf of, of is in parentheses, on behalf of, has replaced in behalf of. Both are still used in American English, but the distinction is frequently not observed. That was interesting. All right, now we have the last word for this episode. It is behave. B-E-H-A-V-E. It is a verb from the 15th century. We are going to start with the transitive definitions. One, to manage the actions of oneself in a particular way. Oneself was in parentheses. Number two, to conduct oneself in a proper manner. Intransitive time. Number one, to act, function, or react in a particular way. Number two, to conduct oneself properly. Behavior is a noun. This is from Middle English, behaven, from B plus haven, which means to have or hold, to have or to hold. And then we're going to end this with some synonym information on the word behave. Behave, conduct, deport, comport, acquit, mean to act or to cause oneself to do something in a certain way. Behave may apply to the meeting of a standard of what is proper proper or decorous, as in, the children behaved in church. Eh, chances are they didn't, but maybe. Conduct implies action or behavior that shows the extent of one's power to control or direct oneself, as in, conducted herself with unfailing good humor. Deport implies behaving so as to show how far one conforms to conventional rules of discipline or propriety, as in, the hero deported himself in accord with the code of chivalry. Comport, spelled C-O-M-P-O-R-T, comport suggests conduct measured by what is expected or required of one in a certain class or position, as in, comported themselves as gentlemen. Acquit applies to action under stress that deserves praise or meets expectations, as in, acquitted herself well in the first assignment. And those last two lines were at the top of page 111. I want to pick the word... Oh, I had one. Well, I think I'm just going to pick Bagora as the word of the episode. That is the euphemism for, by God, it's an interjection. Uh, Let's see. That is all the stuff for the words. Um, Connor, it's your birthday. I don't know if you're listening, but I think your friend is. So happy birthday, Connor. Today is April 17th. Um, that is it. Um, I could mention another podcast on this. Oh, I, my wife and I have been watching, um, American Horror Story. We've only watched two seasons. Um, we watched the ninth season, which is 1984. And we both really love that because it has a ton of references to a lot of stuff, especially 80s stuff. So that was a lot of fun. You should definitely watch that. Um, and then we're almost done watching the hotel season, which is season five. Um, and it started off good, and I think it, the sort of second half got sort of got a little bit slow, a little bit weird. Um, it's still fun. I'm, we're I think we only have one or two episodes left. Um, also, we've been watching Brooklyn Nine Nine. Oh, that show is so good. We just started it, and we uh, we're on the second season now, and it is hilarious. And I can't believe I didn't watch it before. Anyway, I think I'm going to end it there. Thank you very much for listening. This has been Spencer dispensing information into your brain. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to this episode of this podcast called, you guessed it, The Dictionary. This is going to be a half, two-thirds is all going to be about behavior. So I hope that some of you are, I don't know, behavior scientists. I think that is highly unlikely. Uh, Let's see. The first word is behavior. B-E-H-A-V-I-O-R. It is a noun from the 15th century. 1A, the manner of conducting oneself. I conduct myself in a strange behavior. 1B, anything that an organism does involving action and response to stimulation. Is this too loud? I don't know. Uh, Let's see. Now we have 1C. The response of an individual group or species to its environment. Number two, 
the way in which someone behaves, also an instance of such behavior. And number three, the way in which something functions or operates. Behavioral is an adjective and behaviorally is an adverb. Next is behavioral science, two words, noun from 1951, a branch of science as psychology, sociology, or anthropology that deals primarily with human action and often seeks to generalize about human behavior in society. Behavioral scientist is a noun. I actually find this really fascinating. I just think humans and the way that they are and why they are the way they are is really interesting. Uh, but not enough to go study it, I guess. Next, we have behaviorism. It is a noun from 1913, a school of psychology that takes the objective evidence of behavior as measured responses to stimuli as the only concern of its research and the only basis of its theory without reference to conscious experience. What did I just read? Compare to the synonym introspectionism, introspectionism. Yeah, that's the right word. Behavioristic is an adjective. Next, we have behaviorist. It is a noun from 1913. Uh, The last word was from 1913, so this is probably the one who is studying behaviorism. Number one, a person who advocates or practices behaviorism. Number two, a person who specializes in the study of behavior as in an animal behaviorist. I think that's super interesting. Uh, I remember watching, uh, you know, Planet Earth, really any nature shows, and even though it's, you know, edited and shot in a certain way, um, you know, to make certain scenes happen, the behavior of the animals is still what it is. You know, they are still looking for food or looking for a mate or playing or whatever it is, and, you know, their behavior isn't honestly all that different from ours. It's just the the way that they do it is different. Um, and so I, I haven't really had a chance to do this, but I want to just sit down someday in nature and just watch animals for hours. Uh, I know that's not necessarily something most people would want to do, but I think that would be super interesting to me. Just sit and watch squirrels and birds and whatever animals I see and just... See, I mean, just watching my cats is fascinating. The way that they play, the way that, you know, it's like, I want to figure out what's going on in their head. Uh, and I, I like that with with all sorts of beasts and creatures. Uh, all right, now we have behavior modification, two words. Noun from 1970. Psychotherapy that is concerned with the treatment as by desensitization, No, that's, I'm going to skip that part for now. Psychotherapy that is concerned with the treatment of observable behaviors rather than underlying psychological processes and that applies principles of learning to substitute desirable responses for undesirable ones. So there's a couple parts in parentheses. In the beginning, psychotherapy that is concerned with the treatment as by desensitization or aversion therapy... So those are examples. And then at the end, uh, to substitute desirable responses for undesirable ones as phobias or obsessions. Called also behavioral therapy or behavior therapy. So if you've got, basically, if you've got a, a, a habit, a behavior that you do that is undesirable, that you don't like, like chewing your nails or, you know, any range of things, you could try some sort of behavior modification. Do I have anything like that? I don't know. I definitely used to like chew my nails and the skin around my nails for some reason when I was in elementary school, but I don't do that anymore. I think I'm pretty good. Yep. Perfect. Now we have behavior, behaviorism, and behaviorist. These are spelled with an O-U-R. So these are British, chiefly British, variation of behavior, behaviorism, and behaviorist. All right. We are out of the, the behavior section. Now we are into the behead section. Yes, the next word is behead. It is a transitive fer- transitive verb from before the 12th century, to cut off the head of. Synonym is decapitate. I heard some stat recently. I don't know where I heard it or what the context was, but it was something like 4% of people who were asked this question said that they have been decapitated. 
uh, yeah, no, I don't think you have. I think they just, I think people, when they hear questions like that, or they hear words that they don't know, which is fine. You don't, you don't know the word. I don't know a lot of words. That's why I'm doing this. Uh, they, they freak out and they get embarrassed because they don't want to say, I don't know that word. And trust me, I've been there. I've responded to things that I didn't know. And I should have just said, I don't know that. Uh, but you have not been decapitated. Although I guess technically there have been people who were, or there have been people who were technically decapitated, like the two neck bones were severed, but they, you know, their head didn't come off their you know, they were still alive and they were able to fix it or something. Okay, we are going to move on to a word that I used to, used to mispronounce and then I thought I, or I said it one way and then I thought I mispronounced it, but it turns out I did not technically mispronounce it. It is the word behemoth. I used to say behemoth because I didn't know how, I didn't know what that word was, um, but both are totally fine. Behemoth and behemoth. And the reason why I would say this word is because one of the characters from one of my favorite movies, The Nightmare Before Christmas, is named Behemoth. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, he's the guy with the axe in his head. Or am I completely making that up? Maybe I should look this up. Maybe I won't. Okay, moving on. It is spelled B-E-H-E-M-O-T-H. It is a noun from the 14th century. One is often capitalized. A mighty animal described in Job 40. 15 to 24, as an example of the power of God. Number two, something of monstrous size, power, or appearance, as in a behemoth truck. But now maybe I'll go back to saying a behemoth. It's, it's just behemoth. There's no H in the, the uh, that other pronunciation. Now we have behest. It is a noun from the 12th century. Number one, an authoritative order. Synonym is command. Number two, an urgent prompting, as in, called at the behest of my friends. You have friends? Oh, cool. Uh, Let's see, this is uh, Middle English, means promise or command. From Old English, behaze, which means promise. From bahatan, which means to promise. Which is from b plus hatan, which means to command or promise. And there's more at the word height. H-I-G-H-T. I I know H-E-I-G-H-T, but I don't know this one. All right, next and final word for this episode is behind. B-E-H-I-N-D. It is the first form, and we are not going to read the other forms in this episode. It is an adverb or adjective from before the 12th century. 1A, in the place or situation that is being or has been departed from. As in, stay behind. 1B, in, to, or toward the back. As in, look behind. Also as in, came from behind. 1C, later in time. As in, can spring from, no, can spring be far behind. That's a question, right? Can spring be far behind? Uh, 2A, in a secondary or inferior position. 2B, in arrears. Arrears is one word. As in, behind in the rent. Oh, that's bad. 2C, synonym is slow. And number three, which is archaic, still to come. Let's see, the etymology is not interesting whatsoever. Thank you for that. Uh, and we are going to pick, well, well, we'll just pick behavioral science as the word of the episode, because that's sort of all-encompassing of all this behavior stuff, uh, which I think is very interesting. Also, behemoth is a good one. Uh, That is it for this episode. Thank you very, very much for listening. Please go share this and tell everybody you know, and, uh, you know, all the do the stuffs and the things, and wash your hands. I started wearing a mask. When I go out, uh, not necessarily outside, but when I go into buildings, I didn't think that I would be the type of person to wear a mask in a situation like this, Um, but it got to a point where I think it makes sense to, um, yeah, and I actually hope that you are too. I'm actually sad that I'm not seeing more people wearing masks. I see it a lot, but not as many as I would like. 
uh, because this is about protecting yourself from getting it so you don't spread it. It's also protecting other people just in case you have it and you don't know. Uh, our local grocery store that we go to usually once a week has now is now closed for at least two weeks uh, because somebody there ha- was you know diagnosed with COVID. Uh, so this is uh, uh, this is a super serious thing, and more and more places are going to be closing, at least for a, a time. Uh, more and more people are going to be getting it. We are. I think at the beginning of this, I hate to be pessimistic, but I think that's the case. Uh, So please, please, please don't, don't think that this is going away. Don't think that you can start being by people or getting lax on anything. We have to keep up with this for a while, unfortunately. Uh, That is my PSA. I'm going to try and, you know, not do that for a few more episodes. Maybe once or tweet, once or once or twice a week. Once or twice a week is fine. I'm going to end this. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Thank you and goodbye.